my whole thesis right now is like, you know, because I'm sure this happened to you, right? Like, you know, beginning June one, all these people are like, oh my God, you're black. Can I talk to you about being black? I'm at a point where I'm just like, anybody who wants to talk to me, unless it's like a close friend, you got to write me a check. Yep. <laughs> Otherwise, I cannot talk to you. I don't have time, space, or energy for you. So anyway, cancer. We talked about cancer. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> Welcome to Black Cancer. I'm your host, Jodi Ann Beery. My guest on today's episode is Erica Stallings, a New York-based attorney, writer, and BRCA awareness advocate. Erica shares her story about uncovering her BRCA2 gene mutation in her 20s. Okay, quick genetic breakdown. BRCA is just an abbreviation for breast, BR, cancer, CA gene. Everyone has the BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene, but it's the mutation of these genes that can mean it's more likely that you'll get breast cancer, get it earlier, or pass it along genetically to your children. She and I talk about her mother's cancer experience and Erica's own path to genetic testing. We talk about her preventative mastectomy, the importance of medical literacy, and the power and limitations of privilege. Listen up. There are more links for this show than any other show this season. Erica is full with knowledge. So there's no post show this episode. Take that time to check out Erica's links in the notes. And for extra credit, Google her name, read every single thing she has ever written, ever. So good. This is a great one, y'all. So please bear through any technical glitches. We are in the inside times. Here's my conversation with Erica. You'll hear Erica's voice first. And I'm really happy you're doing this because honestly, I think I told you that this is actually how I started any type of freelance writing. Because when I got my diagnosis, it's like just Googling to be like, okay, like there's got to be like a blog or just some something for Black women. And I didn't find anything. And like I looked and I was just like, this can't be. I cannot be the only Black woman who has a BRCA mutation. It's not statistically possible. We're not in this, we don't like get asked to be in the support groups. We don't get asked to do the big campaigns. Like, and then like the flip side of that though is now like every time somebody wants to do a campaign with black people, they call me and I'm just like, y'all gotta like diversify your context. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's a great entry point to start officially. Yeah. What does it mean to be a part of the cancer community without having had a cancer diagnosis? And so making that distinction and how you you feel and comport yourself into the cancer space. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And it's something I'm very sensitive to for a couple of reasons. You know, one is I've seen my mom uh, deal with two different breast cancer diagnoses. So the first was when I was in my childhood, when I was eight, my mom was only 28 years old. Um, that was before researchers knew that there were um, hereditary cancer syndromes, right, that could elevate your risk of cancer. But then the second time my mom had breast cancer, I was in college, it was my senior year of college, and my mom chose to have her treatment, surgery and treatment done at UNC Chapel Hill, which is where I was in school. So I, I saw it very firsthand. You know, my mom would stay with me overnight. You know, I would sit with my mom while she got like chemo appointments and everything. So I always want to make it really clear to people, I have a mutation that gives me a very elevated risk of breast cancer, but I haven't experienced it yet. And I'm really cautious about that because I've seen my mom go through it. I just know what an intense experience that is. But what I sort of view my role in the breast cancer community to be is to share my story with other people, to make people aware of the importance of knowing your family history, of knowing about hereditary cancer syndromes, so that other Black women like myself can have the same opportunity that I have. You know, if my mom had known that we had this mutation in our family, my mom might have been able to take some steps um, to not have that second reoccurrence of cancer, right? And I know, I think it's so when she even has PTSD from that experience. She thought cancer was something that was over for her. She'd been in remission for 14 years and then she got it again. So I view my role in the community as to be able to share my story, share the knowledge, because I want other Black women to be able to make some of the, make those same choices that I was able to make. I think about that in a couple ways. One, what does it mean to be a part of the cancer community when your entry point into it isn't how people generally 
think about cancer narratives. Right. So for even me as someone who has had cancer, but I had surgery and not chemotherapy, there's a distancing there. You know, and I remember chatting with a friend who had cancer, had chemotherapy, but she never lost her hair. And she feels a distancing there, like even within the cancer community of trying to find space for her story, for her experience. And so there are times that I even question, you know, do I belong here? Do I belong in this space? Is my narrative important? But I think similar to you, and I, I love what you're saying here, that everyone has their role in telling the story. Did you have it? What was the experience? Did someone you know have it? Did you not have it? But there's this genetic piece that a lot of folks don't talk about generally, and we certainly don't see women of color, Black women in that narrative. We all have our roles in how we can elevate and work on the prevention side of cancer. And this conversation in the context of Chadwick Boseman's recent passing is, is weighing really heavily on me because he died of something what he was years away from even being screened from it like what is cancer prevention or what is that you know that whole screening process or you know trying to get a sense of are you at risk understanding your risk levels that's a whole piece that we don't talk about and we don't build well into our healthcare system you know you know it's it's really interesting because when i got the news about chadwick boseman's passing last friday i mean he was so you know and i think something that people don't really understand so I want to emphasize it, it's like cancer is not supposed to be a thing that happens to young people, right? When you get cancer at that kind of age, there's something going on. And so part of me was like, did, did Chadwick have a family history of colon cancer? Did he have a family history of cancer? Did anyone ever talk to him about this? And, you know, it's interesting because at the same time, I'm in a group chat with, um, with a lot of Black genetic counselors, and we were all talking about that, right? Like, this is in some ways an opportunity to raise awareness of um, genetic counseling, family history. At the same time, we don't know like what Chadwick's circumstances were, right? Like maybe he did get genetic testing, maybe it came back as variant of unknown significance, right? So it's tough, but I think it, it does emphasize for me why I, why I think the work I do is so important, why I try to do it is because to your point about when you talk about preventative screening, I think a thing people don't realize is that a lot of the preventative guidelines are not based on they don't have good data for our black people. So for example, um, for people who are listening, you know, recently um, the national guidelines for when women should get a mammogram, there's been a lot of debate about whether that should start at like age 40 or age 50. And there was a study that came out from Harvard University, I want to say in 2016 or 2017, I could find it if you want to link it in the notes. But essentially it was saying like those recommendations are based on data from white women. And if you, you use, a, if you actually were to use those guidelines, you would miss a lot of like black women, Latino women, Asian women, right? Because their cancers tend to happen, do tend to happen at an earlier age. So even when we're talking about these national guidelines around prevention, they're not based on data from minorities because a lot of times we're not represented in the studies and we're not represented in these databases. So it's a problem that like permeates everywhere. Yeah, and then we pay for that with our lives. Your bad data, is my bad health outcomes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's, you know, I think it is a time where everyone's really emotional, but, you know, for whatever reason, the Chadwick thing hit me so hard, and I guess it is because of the cancer thing, but I was just like, he had like such a vibrant life, he just seemed like such a good person, and I was just like, Black people, like, not only are we like robbed of many things because of racism, but we're actually like robbed of time. And then the thing that drives me crazy these things happen and I get really stressed out about them. And I'm like, but I can't get too stressed out about it because there's also like data that literally the stress of rest, racism ages us, right? So we age more rapidly than white people because of the stress of racism. And so I'm just like, I'm so mad, but I don't want to be mad because being mad is like literally like taking gears off of my life. So I don't know. I think about that all the time, you know, because sometimes people feel like you're really impatient or like you just, you know, people, yeah, I've had people say to me, like, you're just impatient. Like, you know, you gotta be, you know, things would happen when they happen. I'm like, I'm black. I literally have less time. I think about it all, I just think about that so much. Yeah, no, it, that's so real. 
I think a thing that has been really important to me over the past couple of years, you know, I got my BRCA mutation diagnosis in 2014. It's been really important for me to also try to disrupt some of the narratives around having a mutation, not just from a racial perspective, but also from kind of like an emotional and mental health perspective. You know, that whole fall after I got the diagnosis and made the decision to have surgery, I like I was struggling. <laughs> Yeah. And like, it's only in hindsight that I see how much I was like mentally struggling. But at the time, my kind of mindset was, well, I don't have cancer. I'm getting to do something about it preventatively. This is great. Why am I complaining? I'm not having to go through chemo. I'm not having to go through radiation, which was like not a healthy mindset. And so I think another thing that I, I want to continue to do, you know, through my writing and also talking is to get people to understand like, even if you go through the situation and it has a positive outcome, it doesn't mean that it doesn't like impact you yeah. emotionally. It doesn't mean that it takes a toll on you. And I started seeing a therapist after my diagnosis, like after my surgery. And my, in hindsight, I should have started seeing her like the same week I got the diagnosis. I had all these feelings to process. And I think there's something very unique about America in the way that we kind of like put cancer narratives in these like boxes of like the warrior you know, you're, you're like, you're right, you're fighting a war, you're, you know, cancer's strong, and it's like, no, and guess what, maybe, maybe I am fighting, but that doesn't mean that that fighting is also not taking a toll on me mentally, so, and I also say to people, too, you know, it's like, I had this mutation, I had a mastectomy, the mastectomy dropped my risk of breast cancer from, like, the, you know, 80% to less than 5%, Oh my God. But I'm still I'm, all, I'm at risk for all these other cancers, right? You know, I still have to go get screened for ovarian cancer. I will start getting colonoscopies when I'm 38. I'm at risk for pancreatic cancer. I'm at risk for melanoma. So I kind of like don't necessarily know where my like if my cancer story is over. You know, like knock on wood, I get a lot of screenings. I see really great doctors. They they do all the you know cutting edge stuff. But I've, it's also, it's like, I kind of live in a limbo of like, you know, there is a possibility I could get cancer someday. I don't know. So it's not this really neat narrative you can wrap a bow around. You saw your mother go through this. Um, she survived this, not once, but twice. And you were a close witness to that. And so was that part of how you decided to get the test or, you know, what research you had looked into it? How do you go from, I see this happening I'm gonna go get a genetic test when we know that that's not something that most people do, much less women of color. Yes, so I think that's, I'm really glad you asked me about that because I, I recognize not only do I have extreme privilege, some of this is actually just like luck. So where I grew up, um, which is where you know, my mom was living when she had her second cancer diagnosis, we live in a, we, I grew up in a really small town in Eastern North Carolina it might have 40,000 people, right? So not necessarily your most cutting edge oncology treatment. Oh, that's a mid-sized college with your whole town. Yeah, <laughs> like my whole town, right? And, and as I, I kind of alluded to earlier, because I was finishing my senior year at UNC Chapel Hill, my mom was like, oh, well, actually, it'll just be easy for me to get my surgery and get treated at UNC Lineberger, which is one of the best cancer hospitals like in the Southeast. I think it's because she saw very sophisticated doctors that someone was like, wait a minute, you're a medical history, like this is odd. You've had cancer twice, under, you know, both times under the age of 45. You had an extremely early diagnosis when you had cancer at the age of 28. And you have triple negative breast cancer, which is a more aggressive form of breast cancer that is linked to BRCA mutations. So that's when she got the genetic testing. So since my senior year of college, because I went to those appointments with her, you know, they explained it to us. Okay, like your mom has this mutation, you have a 50% chance of having inherited it from her. So I've known since 2007, it was a possibility. Now, like I went directly from undergrad to law school, and that did not seem like a good time to get life changing information. And then I moved to New York, I didn't have health insurance for a year, um, because I was on like a fellowship. And then when I started a large law firm, I was just like, I'm overwhelmed, I don't have time to get genetic testing. <laughs> but I I had gotten into a pretty serious relationship. Of re I thought the relationship, I thought we were gonna get married. And the person I was dating at that time, their mom had died from cold, stage four colon cancer. And it had happened like very quickly. Like their mom had gotten diagnosed. And then like, I think maybe three or four months later she died. 
Mm. And so that like, the part of me was like, okay, I'm like entering into this very serious relationship with someone who's like also has their own cancer experience. I'm 20, yeah, I was 29. I'm very close to the age when my mom was first diagnosed. I was like, I should talk to someone about this. And the form, like my before I moved to New York, my mom like gave me this form for Memorial Sloan Kettering. It was like, you need to take care of this like when you're in New York. He just been like sitting at my work desk. So I call I call, I call Memorial Sloan Kettering, which if you don't know Memorial Sloan, it's a very great cancer hospital. Oh, I went there. I'm I'm a big fan. <laughs> big, right. <laughs> And they were like, okay, cool. You want to get genetic testing. It's going to take six months, right? Oh. So if people may not know, there's a shortage of genetic counselors in the United States. So there's more people want to get genetic testing than we have genetic counselors. Wow. And I was like, six months? I already had to psych myself up to do this. So this is where the privilege comes in. I, I, had the, I was talking about this with a friend who was like, oh, no, I know this woman, Julia Smith, at New York, at NYU. She works with um, women in their 20s and 30s who are high risk for breast cancer. Just call her, and she'll do your genetic testing whenever you're ready. And I was like, oh, okay. I had no idea who, right? And she's very good. Like, she's super great. I wouldn't have picked anyone else to, like, yeah. go through this journey with me. But I had no idea who she was, right? I was like, NYU, they have they do genetic testing. Like, what? Okay. Um, so, right, so that's where, like, and also I live in New York. Right. I live in New York City. New York City has like several great cancer centers. So some of it's like an accessibility, right? Because I think if I've been living in D.C., you know, maybe even living in D.C. or like North Carolina, I would be like, I don't know how to find a genetic counselor. But, you know, in New York, it, it was like not a huge, um, it wasn't a huge lift. And like I said, it was just one of those things. I guess the other thing that motivated me, too, is I have a really close friend from law school. Yeah. Whose mom died of breast cancer when he was three. And it's really been something that has impacted him his, his whole life. You know, so like, you know, sometimes like we would talk and he would be like, what are you gonna do about this whole like high risk thing? So, you know, I think, I know, he, yeah. He, Plus, he, you know, this whole like high risk thing, what you gonna do about that? <laughs> but he's kind of like, yeah, what's up with that? I was like, yeah, that's a good point. Um, Cause he's, he's Ashkenazi, he's Jewish. Mm -hmm. Ashkenazi Jewish people are, they have a high, a much higher risk of having mutations. And he, his sister had been tested and she was not positive. So, you know, it wasn't their, the cancer their mom had was not BRCA related, but he yeah. was like, yeah, you need to do something about that. So, and so I was like, yeah, I'm gonna do something about it. Yeah. And then I did. <laughs> okay. So I want to, the, the transition between I'm going to do something about it. And then I did, I want to dig into that a little bit because you talked about, you know, having to psych yourself up for this testing only to have to go through the six month process. For someone who's already been exposed, you seem to have folks in your life who have experienced cancer or, or folks in their lives have, have passed away from cancer in very intimate ways. So there's always, there's already a, an openness in, in speaking about it. I'm making assumptions based on your storytelling here. And so what was that psych up process when you're already in these positions of exposure to it? Like what did that feel like for you to have to enter into, oh shit, like I might know something at the end of this, you know? Like how did that land for you? Yeah. So I think of, I think there were like a lot of factors that all came together at the same time. You know, I talked about the relationship. I think another major factor was I was in a place in my job where I was like, I felt really comfortable. Like I had, I was like, okay, people in my job really like me. If I need to take a bunch of time off of work, it'll be fine. And I had like, I also had a lot of, I had like saved a lot of money. So I was like, oh, like if this, if I don't, I have no idea how much it, like a surgery might be if I, if I have a BRCA mutation, but like I've got money in the bank. So it was all those things. Um, but I think in terms of like psyching myself up, like I said, the form had like been in my office and I was like, I would sometimes look at it and it would look at me. Um, <laughs> like, hey, Sloan, I think, how you doing? <laughs> yeah. Like remember the Diddy, you know, the Diddy gift where he's like, Mm -hmm. Given the dude are having the stare down, it would kind of be like that type of stare down. But I think, I, I really think overall, like, I just remember being like, I would hate to call people I love and tell them I have breast cancer or some other type of cancer if there was like something I could have done ahead of time. Like, that was like, I remember thinking about that a lot. Like, I couldn't imagine like calling my mom and being like, Mom, I have breast cancer. Because I remember how devastated I was when she called me and told me she had breast cancer when I was in college so I was just like I just gotta like 
I th- and I think the other thing that motivated me to like go from being like, this is the thing I need to do to like, I'm actually going to do it is the reconstruction options had, had like gotten, a, had, had really like gotten a lot better. And so I want to say by like early 20, like end of 2013, early 2014, the, the like science had shown that you could do what's called a nipple sparing mastectomy, which means you like get to keep your nipples. It gives you a much more uh, realistic outcome mm-hmm. in the breast reconstruction process. The science was like, yeah, this is, you know, you can keep your nipples and it doesn't really um, increase your risk that much, right? And I was like, okay, like, science is pretty good. Seems like a good time. I've got, like, money in the bank. You know, I'm in a relation. You know, and and the relationship thing was so important because before I was like, I don't want to be, like, on the dating market, like, living with this mutation or, like, knowing about it. In my mind, I was like, oh, I've got someone locked down who, like, has to stay with me, which did not not turn out to be the case, but that's what I thought. Um, So I was like, okay, all the pieces have lined up. So let's like, let's do this thing that we need, that I need to do. So yeah, like yeah. you had the resources, you felt like you had the right support in place to move forward with it. And I think that's the luxury, luxury, I don't know, but to be in a preventative space, you don't want to take too much time, but you do have some time to do the research, weigh some options, sort some things out, work your schedule out and all that. Cause then after you you know, get the diagnosis, then things have to work at a much faster pace. You know, that that time option, that weighing of it, you know, isn't isn't really there anymore. And so I remember when I got my diagnosis, the first time I talked to a surgeon, one of my 30 questions that I brought with me <laughs> was, um, when do I need to be in surgery? And he said, Jody Ann, this surgery cannot make you better. It can only try to get close to where you are. And so wow. you need to be in surgery within a week. And I had plans to go snowboarding in Europe. So I was like, um, can we push that back a month? <laughs> and he was not okay with that, but understood that being young, I was 32 at the time and potentially facing paralysis that he's like, if you don't hurt yourself, you know, if nothing changes in the next couple of weeks, go on your trip because I could wake up from surgery and never be able to do something like that again. Wow. Right. And so I think like the preventative space gives you way more time, but after that, you know, God forbid you get into a situation with a diagnosis, you have to start bargaining for what you want to try to keep with your life and what has to drop. Like I, when I got my um, diagnosis, I didn't go back to work for four months. That was my unknown last day at work for four months. Wow. And so that's not really a situation to be in, which I think that's why this message around like prevention um, and genetic testing is, is so critical. So I am curious though, like when you did call your mom and tell her that you were going through the test and then deciding on your mastectomy, like what was her reaction to that? You know, my mom had would like occasionally ask me, bef- you know, before I made the decision to get tested, like, are you going to get tested? You know, like when the Angelina Jolie, so I'm sure a lot of people know Angelina Jolie has a BRCA1 mutation. Uh, she had a very well publicized op-ed in the New York Times about her decision to have a mastectomy. So when that came out, my mom called me and she's like, did you see this? Like, are, you know, when are you going to do it? And I was like, I don't know. I'm not ready to do it. Um, and so I like, and I was trying to downplay it. So I, I mentioned to my mom, like, hey, I finally made the appointment. I don't know, you know, I'll call you when I get the test results. And so it was, you know, it was really hard to call her because my mom blamed herself. She was like, oh, this is a thing that I did to you. And I was like, no, it's not a thing that you did to me. Like, this is just, you know, the draw of biology, right? My, my mom was like, but my mom was very um, adamant, I think, about me having, about me getting a mastectomy, you know, um, you know, because I, like I said, I, I do think her second experience with breast cancer has left her a little bit scarred, like rightfully so. And so she was like, well, okay, like you have this mutation, so you're going to have surgery, right? And I was like, I mean, I'm pretty sure that's like where I'm leaning, but like, I want to talk to some surgeons about it first. And she was like, no, like if there's anything you can do to you know, prevent getting breast cancer, like you need to do it. Um, 
And it was interesting because my, my best friend from college, who is also a doctor, uh, she does pediatrics and internal medicine. She said the same thing. Like I called her after I got the results and she's like, you know, I hope you're going to have the surgery. Like I see patients at the hospital. I used to see patients during my residency who, you know, had a mutation and didn't do anything about it. And then they get cancer and sometimes it's really advanced and like nobody wants to lose you. And I was like, all right, all right, all right. Like this is a lot. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so it was those conversations were like really emotional and they will say like, Probably the most emotional conversations I had were my mom. My mom blames herself. You know, my best friend who, I think because she's a doctor, had some firsthand experience with it. And then uh, my friend from law school, the one who lost his mom to breast cancer, like we went to dinner because I was like, oh, I need to like talk to you about something. I want to tell you like in person. He got like almost, he like almost started crying at the table. And I was like, there's nothing to cry about. Like, I'm going to be okay. Like I have a really great great team. Like it's going to be fine. But yeah, I, I didn't realize like how emotionally like hard it was going to be to like share this news with everybody. And for like my close friends, I told all of them individually. And I swear if I ever get like a cancer diagnosis, like not what I don't, like people are just getting a mass email. Like I don't have, I like, I don't got it. Like I, like I, I, I feel, I feel very strong. Um, yeah. You know, let me tell you something. Okay. I, I, feel that so hard because the telling and retelling and retelling and for me as, as a storyteller right I'm, I want to present it like in the same way every single time with the emotions or whatever and then after a, a little bit of this I fired up MailChimp and designed a newsletter and sent it out to people I say hey if you want to get updates on what's going on with me and I named my tumor Ted. So I was like, if you want some Ted updates, uh, you got to subscribe to this newsletter. And I would just send a newsletter out, <laughs> which was a nice project too, to distract myself because then I was like designing newsletters <laughs> instead of worrying about, am I going to die or be paralyzed for the rest of my life? Yeah, but you know, in a way it's, but you know, it's funny though, when you talk about the story of Italian, I think a thing that has been fascinating to me, and we maybe we can like get more deep into this, like the people who like document every part of their mastectomy journey on Instagram, because like you know there are times like it's interesting because I do all this writing and people are like Erica, you know, if you find hard enough, you could probably like build a brand. And I'm like, you guys, when I'm like at the office and they're about to like give me a transvaginal ultrasound, to, like at my ovaries, like I'm not trying to take like a picture and give anybody like a, a thoughtful caption. Like I'm stressed. I gotta like have that wand like poked up there so they can take pictures of my ovaries. Like no one is trying to like be an IG influencer in that moment. But there are people who do it and I guess I admire it, but I'm just like, I don't, again, I don't have the bandwidth. I'm just trying to like get my blood drawn, get my ovaries photographed, like keep it, keep it pushing. So yeah. I'm being probed right now. I can't figure out what the top uh, hashtags are for this situation. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. You know, when I get probed, I love to be probed by like this brand manufacturer of like, you know, transvaginal ultrasound wands, right? Like that, it's like, it's crazy. But it is a thing. It's a thing that exists. And so, I mean, we could probably have a whole other, you probably have a podcast about like capitalism and cancer, right? Oh. Like the commodification, oh, yeah. the like, anyway, it's just, it's a lot. <laughs> it's the, the commodification of cancer for for real um and okay so you speak a lot about your writings and I have to fangirl on you for a moment but in a lot of my research and things that I was trying to figure out because I also went trying to search the internet for something you know related to this some type of support and I'm sure it's there like they do exist but again you know Black women, people of color, women of color should not have to reach the deepest corners of the internet to find some relevance of our experience. I think that, you know, cancer information for us should be populated as easily as a Wikipedia page. Because you're already going through such a stressful situation. I can't spend two hours researching trying to figure out if anyone is out here experiencing this like me or in some way you know, who has these shared experiences because then every search that comes up short is an affirmation that I'm alone. Yeah. And that feels like shit. <laughs> and so 
As I was going through this process, before, during, and after my situation, I found this article that you wrote for Oprah Magazine, the article that could help save a Black woman's life. I have read this. I have texted this to my doctors. I cite this all the time. I It's a big part of my orientation to this because it finally unlocked for me everything that I had been thinking around about this from my own personal experience perspective and the system of racism in healthcare. And then I met you. <laughs> yeah. I was like, whoa, wait, wait, what? And so we had met and like been in communication for some other stuff. And it took a while for me to connect that you wrote this article that I've read like 15 times. And so in it, and I was revisiting it in preparation for this, you speak a lot, and even in your own sto- storytelling here, about folks that you would talk to about this. And, and your speaking of it unlocked even more resources for you. And so I'm curious if you want to share a little bit more about not only just the testing journey and communicating that with people, but sharing the results with other people. Yeah, no, I mean, it kind of goes back to, you know, I think I, I in my work, that I kind of struggle with, not struggle, but I, I don't like to do things if I'm not being impactful. And the thing that I think I do struggle with around this work is because when you're talking about educating people about like genetics, family history, it's not really about whether you're smart. It's also about like what I like to call like medical literacy, right? Like you can have a PhD or a JD or an MBA, but you might not be like medically literate and medically fluent which is all, it's like, you gotta, you gotta like know how to talk to doctors and ask for that information. And that's the thing that I, I, I have been extraordinarily likely to have for a few reasons. You know, my grandmother is actually a nurse and like in my family, like everyone who ever had medical questions or wanted to know about like information they got from their, their doctor, like everyone went to my grandmother. It's like, I grew up my whole life seeing that. And my grandmother was always like, even when I was a kid, always used to tell me like, just because they are the doctor does not always mean that they are right. Like you ask whatever questions you want to ask and you get like whatever information you want to get. So I'm fully fortunate that was instilled in me at like, I mean, I remember like going to the doctor as a child and my grandma, my grandma would be like, it's okay for you to ask questions. Like, even though you're a child. Yeah. <laughs> but it, so, but so as I said, my, my, you know, my best friend's a, a doctor. She's actually married to a cancer researcher. Specifically, he does bio, bio statistics. So what happens is like people do these very complicated research projects and then they go to Naeem and they're like, we have to figure out like how to actually statistically measure this. And Naeem comes up with very like complicated data sets. It's very impressive. Like when he was getting his PhD, he like showed me some of his homework and I was like, I have no idea what this, this is. This is amazing. And he's actually worked on pancreatic cancer research projects at UNC. So the two of both of them were like, look, these are like the things like when you go to these particular appointments, like don't leave until they tell you like this or you feel comfortable about this, right? And that's, again, like I built up a lot of medical literacy and fluency during my like sort of surgical process. And I was also fortunate because I had a really good friend who was fun employed at the time. And so I would be like, oh, will you go to these appointments with me? Cause it was gonna be like so much information. It's probably gonna be overwhelming. And it was like so great to have like another person just there as like backup with me. And I actually, I remember the day I interviewed my plastic surgeon and my plastic surgeon is very good. Mm-hmm. If you're listening to this and you're in New York, Miha Choi, she does, she gets good results. <laughs> So my friend, she does, she's great. So my friend Courtney went with me. You know, I had already like heard really good things about Dr. Choi. We like were in the the room, you know, she like looks, you know, she like does her examination and she's like, yeah, like you're a 32C now. I'll keep you at a 32C if that's what you want. Your skin is really good. Um, I can do like a direct implant, which means you'll wake up with your implants. I'll do nipple sparing. Like she was like, I know, she was like, I'm gonna get like a great result for you. And I was like, all right cool. I like you. Let's do this. And Courtney was like, wait a minute. I have like more questions. She like asked her all these questions. She's just like, you know, I'm not going to just let anybody operate on my friends. And the Dr. Trump was like, look, I was like the chief resident at Mount Sinai for like plastic surgery. I can like show you my results book. Like I got it. Right. And to this day, when I go see her for like the occasional check-in, she's like, how's your friend Courtney? I'm like, my friend Courtney is very good. But, you know, I was really lucky. I had a lot of people who just cared. And so I didn't have to do it 
you know, by myself. But yes, telling other people just opened up so, I mean, even getting, even finding Dr. Julia Smith, who like coordinated all of the various parts of my treatment, like that came through a friend, right? Yeah. You know, I got so much from just not moving through this in isolation. Um, well, so let's like talk about the Oprah piece for a little bit, because this is something I've only realized recently. The woman I'm talking about, Julia Smith, is an oncologist, and oncologists can also get board certified to do genetic testing. So she did my genetic testing. She gave me the results. And when she gave me the results, she was like, based on your family history, you should have a risk preventative mastectomy as soon as possible. So she's like, I'm going to I'm gonna send you to this surgeon, this plastic surgeon, this um, ob joint who specializes in you know, high-risk patients. Here's your dermatologist. Here's everything you need. And if you get pushback from anyone or you can't get an appointment, you just call, like, you call my office and, like, I will make it happen. And I was like, okay. Right? So my whole sort of experience, like, with NYU, um, like, at my various appointments, I, I felt like I was operating with a lot of privilege, you know, because, like, I think people knew I was, like, Julia's patient. But, like, when I actually had my surgery, which was at, like, NYU Hospital, uh, I write about this in the old magazine piece. I knew from my mom's experience, from talking to people, that the, my biggest risk after a mastectomy was like one of the drains getting infected. Because what happens is after the surgery, you have these two plastic drains that are like pretty far up, right, in your body, um, and they stay there for about a week. And the day I was supposed to be discharged, one of them was not working. Like I could see that there was just like no flow happening on one side. And so when they came to discharge me, I was like, well, I don't want to be discharged until you send a nurse or someone else to like look at this. I don't want to go home until it started out. And they were like, it's fine. You'll just have to sort of like manually pump it on that side. And I was like, I'm not doing that. Not doing that. And I was like, why can't you just call someone to come look at it? It took, Jody. it took two hours. We literally had a two hour standoff. It was my mom, myself, and two of my friends that I called to the hospital to cover back up. I got a call for that <laughs> I did, because I was like, well, because my surgery was, had been late at night. I was exhausted. I didn't sleep well. My mom had stayed up with me. And so I like call, at first I had called a male friend of mine to just like, I live in a, a one floor walk up. And so I was like, hey, like, just come meet us. Like, you know, just in case like I have issues getting into the apartment. He was like, fine. Oh, he was like, yeah, of course. I mean, I, he didn't say fine. He was very happy to do it. Okay. <laughs> but then when I saw that these nurses were tripping, I like texted my friend Courtney and I was like, Courtney, like we're at the hospital. There's some shenanigans. Like, will you like come for backup that's literally what I said I was like there's shenanigans please come for backup I'm so tired yeah but we had to stand off and they like sent someone from like the hospital administration and they, and I was like why can't someone just call someone finally at one point I think you know I'm like still kind of groggy from anesthesia I said to my mom I was like mom just call Dr. Choi's office and see what they say right because no one at the hospital would call them I was like just call her and see what she says and she like responded in like two minutes and she was like yeah, she's like, look, I can't physically come to the hospital, but tell the hospital to like pay for a cat for you and come to my office so like I can see what's going on. And I was like, okay. And of course, when I got there, she like looks at it and she's like, oh yeah, like the incision here isn't big enough for this to flow properly. It took her five minutes to fix it. And then I was like on my way. But I was like, why did it take two, like two hours of me fighting with these people when I was trying to do something to prevent a major complication and then, so I kind of, like, in that moment when I'm looking back on it, I was like, oh, like, I have been operating through most of NYU with a lot of privilege because people knew that I was a patient of this important person. But when I got to the hospital, I was probably just another Black woman Yeah. that people thought that they could sort of just, like, be dismissive of, right? Um, and I should have filed a complaint against NYU, and then I was just tired from after having surgery, and so I didn't do it. But, like, that experience has just, like, really stayed with me because I'm just, like, I'm trying to do something that like benefits everybody in the room like me the patient you the hospital so that like I don't have to see from malpractice it, and it, it was like it was literally something that took five minutes and I'm just like this is insane yeah but like that happens all the time it happens all the time and it's so funny when you're saying I wish I filed a suit but I was too tired and I think of all the data points that don't exist because people aren't filing it because they're having to deal with surviving and, and recovering from, you know, what they went through. Uh, you know, when I went through my experience to the first person I called is someone who's highly medically literate, my friend who's a nurse practitioner. And the second person that I called, I didn't, the last person I called was my mom for the same reasons you're talking about. Like, how do you tell your mom that this is what you're going through? 
Well, the second person I called was my friend who's a radiologist. And not only was he trying to help me understand my, my results of the MRI, but he was telling me how to carry myself in the doctor's office when I met with the surgeons. And he's like, you need to bring people with you, not only to just support me, but you have to show the doctors that there's a whole team of people who care about you. You have a master's in public health. Do the research and speak in a health type medical language. You have to figure out how do I compensate for my blackness right now? How do I become important to these people to have them feel like not only do people care about you, but she has resources to, you know, sue me for malpractice or what have you. And then here goes you who has all of that and you're a lawyer and you're still having to deal with, as you say, the shenanigans. I know you were talking about you fangirling my writing, which I really appreciate. And so I'm going to fangirl somebody else. Uh-huh. Um, Tracy has this amazing book of essays called Thick. Yes. And one of the, one of the essays is called Dying to be Confident. Like I actually read it recently because there was, it was relevant. It was on my mind. And so this is an essay about when she like had, she went into premature labor. She'd been in premature labor for three days, but like none of her doctors were like taking her complaints seriously. Um, And so she just talks about how like black women are always fighting to be viewed as like competent and like worthy to be heard. And she sort of wraps it around like that story. And it's just like, it's so good. And she just talks about how like, when you look at like the American healthcare complex and like you combine that with capitalism, right? Like when that, when that, those systems like go into motion, like black women are just almost always doomed, right? Like the system is sort of just designed to never view us as competent and to always like eat us up. I think about that essay a lot. I think about that situation a lot. Um, Yeah, because in that moment, you know, because sometimes I also wonder, like, when I say I was tired, I was too tired to file a complaint. But there's also part of me that's like, you know what, I could have easily been like, I had this surgery, I still got anesthesia in my system. Like, I just want to go home and I don't want to, like, keep fighting. But, like, you know, like, what would have happened, right? It's, like, scary to think that our lives can sometimes just be impacted by, like, these, like, limbs that we, like, can't control. Sorry, I know I got real deep, but, like, I... No, no, I just, I, you're saying this, and it's recalling for me all the times during this particular journey that I had to say out loud, I'm tired of fighting. I just want to go home and I just want to take care of myself. And a lot of times I still had to fight anyway. First of all, I'm fighting my, with my own health and my own body and I'm fighting this structure and you can't do it all the time. And then I resent the fact that I have to do it. But for me to be a good ancestor, you know, I tried to leave this shitty system better than how I entered it in some type of way, you know? So I, one of the things that I do, I do a lot of fundraising and like speaking and advocacy for this um, research center called the Basser Center for BRCA. Um, It's the first ever research center and all they research is BRCA related cancers. So the woman who runs it, Dr. Susan Domchek, who is amazing, and one of the smartest people I've ever met, right? Like, I mean, she is the four, one of the foremost experts on BRCA in the United States. Yeah. And so sometimes people are like, oh, are you, you know, you're afraid that you might get ovarian cancer someday. And I'm like, yeah, I guess. But I was like, if I got it, I'd just like go to the Basser Center and have like Susan treat me, right? Like the, the only reason I know Dr. Domchak, the only reason I'm connected with the Basser Center is also like a luck of the draw. Like someone there saw something I wrote one time and like reached out to me. And so it's like this weird thing of like, wow, like if something bad happened to me, I would have access to some of the best doctors in the world, but I had to hustle so hard and create my own luck to be able to get that. And some people just have it, right? And like, I think about all the work that black women have to do to build protective systems for ourselves as like a safety net. Yeah. And so in that vein of, you know, thinking about all the work to, even for you, someone who had to earn some of these privileges to create an ecosystem that could support you, create your own luck, as you say. You know, for folks out there who are thinking about genetic testing or maybe on the fence or maybe I'll push it off later after this COVID thing is done, right? What would you you say around pursuing genetic testing, particularly during the context of COVID-19? 
I do know that many institutions have actually moved to doing genetic counseling via telemedicine. Um, so that that is a possibility if people are worried, if you're worried about going to an in-person visit, um, you can access genetic counseling uh, via telemedicine. And I'm, I think what happens is like, you know, you actually have the whole like discussion of your family history and then they can send you like the actual uh, testing kit. So, um, it, and, and there's like research that genetic counseling via telemedicine is just as effective and impactful as when you have it in person. So that's something that I would encourage people to think about. I think a thing I hear all the time from people is they're just like, I don't want to get genetic testing because I don't want to have a mastectomy. And I'm like, what I have to explain to people is like, it's not automatic. Like in my situation, my family history warranted having a mastectomy pretty quickly. But I have other friends who have BRCA mutations who, you know, they just do enhanced surveillance. They get a mammogram and an MRI every six months. I know some people who take chemo preventative drugs, they take tamoxifen. So I think it's important, you know, to go back to our conversation about like Chadwick Bozeman and preventative care. It's really important to have the information because at least if you have the information, you can like figure out what you want to do, right? Like you're not operating in a vacuum and it doesn't really just impact you. I mean, I don't have siblings. You know, in some families, like once you find someone who has a mutation, then you can start tracing forward, you can trace back, you can like figure out like how many people are impacted. So I think I think I would really encourage people is like you're at quarantine, you're home, have a conversation with your family about cancers that have occurred, do it and like on both sides of the family, right? You're, it can be inherited from um, your mother or your father. Yeah. Uh, and then yeah, and if you go to if, the website is nsgc.org, National Society of Genetic Counselors. You can put in your zip code and it will help you to find genetic counselors in your area. I think, you know, I encourage people to like, you know, still do it. Um, e even now, like, you know, it's just information that is so important. And I also think it's really important too, to your point, right? Like, you know, one thing that did give me comfort was like, okay, like if I have a mastectomy, at least I'm having it now. I'm not battling cancer. I'm not dealing with chemo and all this other stuff, right? Like, you know, I can do it on my own time. I can like give myself time to get like super healthy. So there's all, I don't want to say there's a control element, but you know, particularly given all the things that we're up against, um, I think having that information sort of like helps you to like take more control. Absolutely. You can take more control and you're putting yourself in a position where you have more options. Yeah, I think a thing I also hear from people too is like, oh, well, I've already had cancer. So like, I don't need to look into this. But I think I really want people to understand is that like, if you are diagnosed with cancer, you, it's still super relevant to have genetic testing because like they might have to do a different type of chemo for you. Like there might be different treatment options, like particularly with something like ovarian cancer. B uh, ovarian cancer is linked to BRCA mutations. Um, they have like specialized therapies and treatments that they do for those patients, right? But if you don't know, you're not going to get access to those things, right? So, and I think particularly to, you know, for black people, we know that when we are diagnosed with cancer, it's often caught at like much later stages when it's harder to treat. And so at least if you know you're at a higher risk, the goal would be um, either you can take preventative steps like I did, have a mastectomy, really drop your risk down, or at least if you do get cancer, it would be caught at like stage one when it's very treatable. Yeah. So. yeah. That's real. Okay. So you already gave us a recommendation around the book Thick by yeah. Tracy McMillan Cotton. And I'm looking at right now on my shelf that I have not opened because I have a habit of buying books that I want to read but doing more of the buying than the reading. <laughs> um, it's, it's like, it's really, it's really good. Like I sometimes like, I'm sorry. So like, I don't know if you saw this whole thing with this woman, Jessica Krug, this like white woman professor who was pretending to be Afro-Latina. Oh, is it the whole Rachel Dolezal part two situation? It's Rachel Dolezal part two. Yeah. But one of the essays in Thick is about the Rachel Dolezal situation. So I was rereading it on the, like, on when I was at the doctor today. Like, you know, why do these white women want to pretend to be us? <laughs> I want to see you try to pretend to be us in a doctor's office when you need people to believe you, you know? Right. <laughs> right. Try that out. Yeah, put that, put that mask on then. Yeah, exactly. Ugh, anyway. 
Um, okay, so I want to end with some listener recommendations for folks. Yeah. Name someone that you think our listeners should know. Something they should read if you have any other recommendations besides thick, and something that they should listen to. Someone that they should know. That is a good question. Um, can I recommend two people really quickly? Because I'm both very proud of them. Hell yes. Someone who's like career and worth ethic, I really strive to emulate is my friend Eve L. Ewing. Eve like does everything. Eve is from Chicago. Uh, she has a PhD from Harvard University. Um, her work, she's now a sociologist at University of Chicago. Um, and her work focuses on educational inequality. She had a really great book called Ghosts in the Schoolyard, which is all about the impact of school closings in Chicago, like on uh, specific black neighborhoods. She also writes for Marvel. <laughs> she wrote Ironheart for Marvel. I think she's working on something for TV. Hell yeah. Like she is just like so creative and disciplined. And I'm always like, how do you do all this stuff? And she's like, well, the secret is I'm only doing one of those things at one time, right? Like, you know, which okay. is something I'm like, all right. She's like, look, when I'm working on Marvel, I'm not working on all of the stuff. When I'm working on my academic stuff, I'm not doing Marvel. And I'm like, okay. Um, so she, and she was actually recently in the special edition of Vanity Fair that ta Coates just guest edited. She has a really great essay about um, police unions and how they block police reform. And my other person who I think people should know is also my friend, Josie Duffy Rice. Um, she is the president of The Appeal. Josie is really like a leading voice and scholar around police reform, police abolition. She also had an essay in the Vanity Fair about what, it, what are we really talking about when we talk about like uh, police abolition. And one of the things I really admire about Josie is that like, I've known her I think since 2014, 2015. And she was like really one of those people like who was very early thinking about like the impact of prosecutors, the impact of district attorneys on how you um, have a more progressive um, criminal justice system. So those are my two people I think people should know if you don't know them. In terms of books, so a lot of people probably know Men Jin Lee because she had this really great book, Pachinko. But her book before Pachinko, which is called Free Food for Millionaires, is one of like my favorite books like ever. Um, and Men Jin is like a Georgetown Law graduate, just like me, who like transitioned and is now doing cool stuff. But Free Food for Millionaires, if you liked Pachinko, I think you would also really like Free Food for Millionaires. Everybody should read that. It's very good. That's my book. I bought, I got that book recently um, after reading Pachinko and then, cause it's the inside times now, right? There's so many different events. And so I was in this event where surprisingly there were maybe 20 people in the room. I'm like, are y'all wild? Do you know who this is? It's Min Jin Lee. And I was able to talk to her like over Zoom. Oh, wow. Whoa. I'm very jealous. And so after, after I was on the call with her, before the event was over, I went and purchased uh, Free Food Familiars because most people who were on the call were talking about Free Food Familiars and not Pachinko. I was like, I'm missing out. I need to go back. <laughs> yeah. Um, wait, I can I, I'm going to cheat. So the other thing I think you should be aware of, it's not a book. Um, it's actually Eve put me onto this. So I really like sparkling water. I'm, I used to be a Spindrift person. And she put me onto this brand called Sanso. Uh -huh. So it's like the first Asian inspired sparkling water brand. Like they have flavors like lychee and mango. It's so good. And you text to order. So like in a, anytime you need to like re-up, you just text. Like literally the last time I ordered, I texted, need to re-up two cases or whatever. <laughs> and it came in like five hours, like to my house, like leaving like in a black van. Uh, but the water is very good. The water like itself is very good. And then kind of how you order it is like, kind of cool. Yeah. So I saw she posted about it on IG and I was like, oh, I'm gonna try it. And I'm, I'm really hooked on it. Yeah. <laughs> um, the thing people should listen to, I, I feel like I'm talking about Tressie a lot, but I, she's also North Carolina. I love people from North Carolina. She has a podcast with uh, Roxane Gay called Here to Slay. I've listened um, I, so good. So I just, um, I just started the episode that they did about Kamala's uh, VP nomination. Um, I'm really excited. They just also did an essay, I'm sorry, episode about the importance of Black people protecting their intellectual property that I am very excited about. And the other two podcasts you should listen to, I would recommend Black Men Can't Jump in Hollywood. It's these three Black guys and they review movies with leading Black actors. It's great. And then they no longer make the episodes, but the archives are up, I think. It's called Denzel Washington is the greatest actor of all time, period, 
with W. Kamal Bell and Kevin Avery, it's like so like those I really wish I mean look, they're both doing other cool things. I get why they don't want to do the podcast anymore. But that podcast was so good. And they were like starting to do these interviews with like like you know, they did one with Jesse Williams, they did one with like Sterling K. Brown, they had one with Ryan Cooler. Actually I might go listen to the Ryan Cooler one because of Chadwick. But that podcast is great. You should listen to all those podcasts. You you inside, you ain't got nothing else to do. <laughs> You just in your house. That's real. <laughs> well, yeah, for sure. I, I feel bad now because you listed all these books that I actually have within arm's distance from where I'm sitting right now, and I haven't read any of them. And so thank you so much for your <laughs> recommendations. Um, and thank you so much for being here. And this this has been incredible. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Like you said, you know, we met because the city bar is like, we got to talk about this racism against women of color. And I'm like, but I'm so glad I met you. <laughs> yeah, no, that's helpful. I talk about our initial meeting a lot because I knew I was going to be on a call with all women of color. And I sat in my chair and was like, I'm going to do my hair during this call. And That's real. To, and to know that I was around women of color that I didn't really know because I just met you in that context and that I knew that I could still feel seen and be myself and just have that break in the meetings of the day where I can just be Jodi Ann, the person, in addition to Jodi Ann, who is going to show up professionally in this way to moderate this panel with these in- incredible, incredible women. Um, that, that meant the world to me. I talk about it all the time. I was like, yo, I got up on a Zoom call with these people I didn't even know. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna do my hair. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it, no one has been interested in publishing it, so whatever. Uh-huh. <laughs> but like a story, I know, I'm just like, why does anybody want to take this? A story I really want to write is, um, I read this book earlier this year. It's called um, You Don't Look Like a Lawyer, which mm-hmm. is all about the experience of Black women in law firms. And she, one of the things she talks about is this idea of the inclusion tax. And the inclusion tax is like both like the emotional and actual financial burden that black women have to pay to be in like predominantly white spaces. And so like what you're talking about, right? Like the fact that you had a space you come to and be like, oh, like I don't have to pay the toll. Like I can just be me is is so important. I think people don't think about like all the contortions that we have to do like before we actually do our job. Like I'm working like three jobs in my job because I have to like do my job and be palatable to you and like you know like the sort of like so mental impact of it exactly my job the work to show up for you and me having to deal with my level of integrity of the fact that i have to change myself to be in these spaces yeah so you know yeah so let's see if rachel uh dolezal and rachel dolezal part two want to be doing that shit for 20 years <laughs> well Something I keep thinking, I, I can't stop thinking about is, um, this goes, goes back to Tressie. We were talking about some ideas for like pieces and she said something to me. She was like, Pardon the interruption. What follows is an amazing conversation Erica recounted having with Tressie about black women and work. Erica and I talk about a new framework for understanding black feminism. The conversation was so good, but I'm protecting the intellectual property here to give space for Erica, Tressie, and me, and me, (laughs) to create something with these ideas. Call me Erica and Tressie. Let's talk about writing. Now back for our regularly scheduled program. Like every once in a while, I'll be like, damn, black women always working. (laughs) And can I, just speaking back to the cancer thing, we internalize this too, right? Of needing to be productive, keep working, not taking that time potentially. And when you and I had first spoken about this, you didn't take as much time as you should have you, in, in your view. Yeah, I mean, so when I had, I had a, a preventative mastectomy on December 1, uh, and I took a month off of work, you know, and it's, right? Because I think it were a couple of things going on. Part of me was like, oh, I want people to know that like I'm back and I'm healthy and this thing didn't like break me, right? Like I need to just like return to normalcy. I was like forcing myself to return to normalcy. So like I went back to work after a month, which again, in hindsight, I'm like, that was crazy. I should have taken like two months, three months, like to deal like emotionally with everything that was going on. And that's like advice that I give people. I'm like, look, 
if you have to take some savings out or like whatever you need to do, like you got to give yourself that like time to heal and process from it. Yeah. I went back to work after like four weeks and like physically that was fine, but like mentally it was not fine. I didn't want people to think anything was off. I was like, yeah, look at me. I had a mastectomy and I'm still going. Yeah. It's not healthy. <laughs> <laughs> like, what, what was that, like, mental draw for you? Because I could easily hear someone say, which I'm, I'm even annoyed to even repeat this, right? But, girl, you didn't have cancer. Um, and you had this great plastic surgeon for your mastectomy. What is the mental toll? You're good. <laughs> oh, no, that happened. I, like, actually, um, when I was, like, really first starting to write, I did write about that, right? Like, I th- it was like March, so I had my surgery in December, and I was like, I had, I had, um, I don't think they do it anymore. So like in New York, this is like a cool New York thing. On Sunday nights, the Standard Hotel used to have bingo, but bingo wouldn't start until eleven o'clock at night, and they would serve these giant like champagne punch bowls. Yeah. And like, you, and it, like the reservations sell out in like five minutes, and I, but I like had managed to get one. It was like. I don't know why it was very important to me to be like, we are going to bingo at the Standard Hotel. We're gonna get drunk. We're have a good time, which we did. Uh, I don't know why it was so important to me. And so like during this, like while we're there, obviously I've like had a bunch of champagne punch, and I'm like, oh, you know, guys, I'm just like celebrating. I'm like alive. I got through the surgery, and everyone's like, what are you talking about? Like you were not like at risk of dying. Stop being dramatic. And I'm like, no, but that, it felt dramatic. Like you know, and so yeah. It, it's hard. And, you know, I will say, like, there are people in my life, like, that I'm friends with, who I felt like they're, the whole situation created some real space. Because, you know, I think when you're 29, it's not, it's not usual to think about, like, cancer or dying or, like, major health issues, right? Like, it's, those are rare for people our age to have gone through. And so it does create a little bit of separation between you and other people of, like, oh, you haven't gone through something like this. And then I started doing all the activism and stuff too. And it's kind of like, you know, some of my friends were just like not in that place when they were like 31 the way that I was. So it can be kind of lonely sometimes, right? Like, you know, now I have a really great group. I kind of like put the group together myself, which is like all women of color who have BRCA mutations. Um, And of the four, like of the five of us, four of us are actually lawyers, right? But that is literally... I assembled it, like people would reach out to me when like they saw stuff I wrote and I was like, wait, we all live in New York, let's like start having brunch together. Yeah. So I have a support system, but I had to build it. <laughs> um, but yeah, and sorry, that was a long rambling way of saying, yes, there are some, or people be like, we're having like a boob job and it's like, no, that's not it either. Um, so yeah, that's the other reason I like to rate and talk about this stuff a lot is to like demystify it for other people. To be like, look, if you have a friend going through this, like, this is how you can actually be supportive. Don't say, don't say dumb things. Like, it's a, it's a boob job. (laughs) I like that you just rambled on about that because it's something that I was just talking to my therapist about yesterday because it's something even two years out that I'm still wrestling with. Cause I had a really strong group of friends who, when I had my diagnosis were like, all right, let's go. And I had so many people around me I had a huge potluck party at my friend's place the day before I left Seattle to go to New York. So I had my surgery at Sloan and I documented everything, not in the way that you're talking about, but I, um, I would post videos of me and my walking process like how I learned how to walk and so it was public in terms of oh she's not just like she's still in the hospital you know what I'm saying (laughs) like there's things going on and so it was less so around wanting to be an influencer and and more so around wanting to normalize what was happening for me in this really isolated space for my community right and yeah me from needing to tell 10 people how tough it was to realize that today I, I realized that I, I couldn't write, I couldn't even write my own name, right? Wow. And so documenting all of this, came back to Seattle way earlier than I should have, six weeks after my surgery, to the point where I um, came back in a wheelchair and had a coworker, so not even my closest friends, but like a coworker who I was very good friends with, um, pick me up and go through that whole thing. 
not one person and sometimes i look at i could literally probably print out this photo that we took at my friend's place for the potluck and put x's on every single person because no one that was present for that party texted me visited me emailed me called me asked me if i needed help no one yeah. I felt like people didn't want to be around me or people who were around me, like you're saying, they're just not in the same space where you are mentally in terms of how you're understanding your body and, and life. Like, I can't talk to you about some dude that I swiped on when I'm still trying to figure out how to be, you know what I'm saying? Like, I care about different things now. I have to focus on different things now. And it took maybe two a year and a half close to two years for me to then decide that people aren't trash and maybe i can rebuild a circle once i started speaking more openly about it and trying to find folks who aligned with my life experience in some way and so a lot of people who i spend a time with very intimate time with are folks who had some big medical trauma in their lives in some way and that feels like a more psychologically safe social network to be around as I'm still rebuilding and and wanting to take my social world in a different direction. Yeah, no, I, I 100% understand that, right? And I'm kind of like you, like I got to a point where I was like, oh, it's not that my friends are trash, because they're not trash. Like I think for whatever reason, people think, um, people think friendships are not like, uh, are not like romantic relationships, right? But the truth is like much like, romantic relationships, sometimes people just like grow apart, your relationship like evolves. And, it, and that's something I talked about extensively in therapy too, right? Cause I was like, am I a bad person? Am I trying to be like morally superior because I like, you know, had this experience now I like write and do fundraising. My therapist is like, no, like maybe you've just like, right? You're just not the same person. I think one thing that was really important and like healing overall was being like, you know what? Like you're never gonna go back to being normal. Like the person you were before all this, like, you know, kind of is symbolically like gone. And dead right and you have to sort of like figure out who you are after after this experience right and that's okay like you don't have to try to keep holding on to this person you were before yeah um but yeah i sort of sometimes feel like okay like i symbolically you know died in the surgery and this is like the new person that i am and that comes with new relationships yeah like this one yeah exactly <laughs> Black Cancer is created, edited, and produced by me, Jodi Ann Beery. Thank you so much, Erica, for sharing your story. To make sure that Black Cancer stories like this one become centered to how we talk about cancer, rate, subscribe, and most importantly, leave a review. You can find us online at blackcancer.co and on Instagram at underscore black underscore cancer. Trauma comes with endless wisdom for ourselves and those around us. Tell someone you know about Black Cancer.